Good afternoon, everybody. I hope my talk won't be too basic, but in any case, I hope you enjoy it. My name is Marta, and I work at the Universitat Autónoma de Barcelona. And I'm going to talk about the contribution of DNA damage to aging and senescence. Mm. Aging is characterized by progressive loss of physiological integrity that leads to impaired function. And um, it ends in a common diseases like diabetes or heart failure, these kind of diseases you know better than me. All mammals age and most organisms age, but it's difficult to define how aging begins or because it's very multifactorial. So I follow this paper, very nice, in which they describe nine hallmarks of aging. Um, we are not talking about all of them, but all these hallmarks are present in aging cells, aging tissues, and aging organisms. And uh, when you experimentally alleviate them or aggravate them, the aging process changes. It gets ameliorated or it gets worse. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to focus on on the hallmarks that um, are more related with DNA damage, hmm? because DNA is the central molecule of life, and it's been described everywhere that with aging, a lot of DNA damage is accumulated in cells. So there's a lot of um, hmm? exogenous or endogenous damage that can damage the DNA, so we generate, for example, oxygen species, but also external damages like radiation or chemicals, they can damage DNA, and they can generate a multiple kinds of lesions. But the lesions more important for us, or more deleterious for DNA, are double stamp breaks, which are here, in which both strands of DNA are broken. These are really dangerous, because if we get a lot of double stamp breaks and they don't rejoin uh, like they were originally, we can get mutations that can, uh, in the end, be potentially oncogenic. Mm -hmm. So the cell gets, every cell in your organism gets between 10 and 50 double stamp breaks every day, every day. So this is a lot. And fortunately, fortunately, uh, cells have uh, a lot of repair processes to cope with all these breaks. What the cell does is to start the DNA damage repair pathway, or the DNA damage response, in which, first of all, stops the cell from progressing, from dividing. Can, the cell can stop in any of the phases of the cell cycle, and then a lot of DNA repro repair proteins are recruited to the DSB site to be repaired. There's a lot of, uh, well, there's a lot of, no, but there's many repair pathways. These are the both most important repair pathways of double stamp breaks, which are the non-homologous enjoining and the homologous recombination pathway. The, more, the most important difference is the non-homologous enjoining pathway is able to function during the whole cell cycle. And this is why important, because a lot of cells do not divide anymore while we are alive. For example, neurons. They are always in G1, so they only have one repair pathway to rely on. The other pathway, the homologous rejoining pathway, is restricted to S and G2 phases, which means after DNA has replicated. So it can only work in those cells that replicate, that actively divide. Also, homologous rejoining is more faithful repair pathway because um, they, this pathway uses the template of the other uh, homolog, the, of the chromosome that's homolog to the one that's broken to be repaired. So repair is always, always faithful. With non-homologous enjoining, what this pathway does is to very fastly rejoin the ends of two broken chromosomes. But if there's too many broken chromosomes, or if the repair gets a little bit slower, mistakes can arise. So what happens when we have these breaks in the DNA of our cells? 
first thing can happen, and we all expect, is that the repair is correct, the cell goes on, cycles again. Another thing that can happen is the damage is too big and the cell cannot cope with it. So one thing the cell can do is to die by apoptosis, or it can stop replicating and enter in a senescent state. This cell is metabolically active, but cannot replicate anymore, it cannot divide. So it cannot transmit the damage that's carrying with her. What we don't like, but sometimes happen, is that repair is incorrect. If we accumulate incorrect repair, then um, we can activate oncogenes or we can suppress tumor uh, suppressor genes. And this is a common finding in aging and also in cancer, which is also a disease related with aging. So, in age cells of mice, rats, but also human, we, found, we find accumulation of breaks which are not repaired or breaks which have been incorrectly repaired. Also, another evidence that links aging with uh, double stamp break repair or with repair efficiency is that those individuals who have mutations that affect DNA repair proteins present uh, a premature aging phenotype. These phenotypes do not phenocopy all characteristics of aging, but quite a lot of them. So there's another evidence of how much uh, DNA repair or maintenance of genomic stability is a must for uh, the aging process. The big question here is, um, do cells accumulate more damage just because we, we've been spending a lot of years alive, or it's because the repair mechanisms function less efficiently? This is something that we try to answer, a lot of uh, research groups try to answer, and something my research group tries to do, and if I have time, I will explain lately, later something about it. Another hallmark of aging is telomere shortening. You know telomeres are stretches of DNA at the end of chromosomes. And these ends of chromosomes, they form a loop on themselves to avoid the repair machinery to fuse them. And you can, here you can see chromosomes with the four telomeres that we should have. It's been described that with age, you can see up on, the, on your right, on my right, sorry, how telomeres shorten with every cell division in somatic cells. This is so for everybody. The only cells that do not lose telomere length are stem cells and germ cells. But all the other cells, with each cell division, we get shorter and shorter telomeres. When telomeres get too short, they also activate the DNA damage response because if not, these ends which have no telomeres, they can uh, get reorganizations between them and uh, function as dicentrics that in the end will break during mitosis and we have two cells with more unrepaired breaks that can combine between them and this is the onset of genomic instability. So short telomeres are very efficient at uh, starting the DNA damage response, halting the cell, inducing senescence. And it's been described that um, mice with short telomeres have a decreased lifespan. Mice with longer telomeres have a longer lifespan. So telomeres definitely uh, in, in influence aging. This very nice experiment in which uh, adult animals in which telomeres had begun to shorten were um, uh, experimentally transfected with the telomerase enzyme, which is an enzyme that is able to elongate telomeres. And um, this elongated the life of these mice. So finally, the last um, reference I show you is a, a very new work in which they found a very strong correlation between short telomeres and mortality risk. 
and this they have found in young people. So it means maybe aging can be predicted, I don't know. I just throw here the question, but uh, maybe checking the telomeres at a young age might be a good idea. This is something we can leave to discuss. Another hallmark of aging is um, epigenetic changes. All these are epigenetic changes we can find in all cells as they age. For example, methylation of the DNA changes, and uh, this affects um, basically transcription of uh, genes, which are tumor suppressor genes, and this transcription is diminished, so the neoplastic transformation is uh, favored. Also, there are less I-stones in cells which are aged, so that means that we have a more relaxed uh, DNA damage and it's more uh, prone to be broken and gene expression also change. One of the stones especially related to DNA damage is the one up H4K16, is, um, is the H4 high stone, which is uh, acetylated in lysine 16. And this high stone is very, very strongly related to DNA repairability. It diminishes with age, although there's a lot of, a lot of um, um, contradictory results. It's now beginning to be clear that it clearly it reduces with age, and it has a role in recruiting DNA repair proteins. So its reduction with age implies that uh, DNA repair uh, will be less efficient in these cells, so more breaks will accumulate. So everything is a sign. Finally, also, changes in heterochromatin are linked with aging. When we age, heterochromatin yeah, diminishes a little, but most of all, it gets redistributed. If a gene is compacted in an heterochromatin structure, it's mm, almost impossible to be transcribed and all these changes in transcription, in DNA um, damage, and in chromosomal instability drive aging. Hmm? And also they drive cancer. Lately, a lot of effort is do, it's done uh, at the research level, but also at the pharmaceutical level with the Sirtuins family. These are deacetylases. So they are proteins that deacetylate high stones and uh, are very good targets for aging. It's been described that uh, mostly sirtuin 6 loss of function reduces longevity. So its gain of function extends longevity in mice. It has not been proven in human yet, but they are trying to uh, settle the experimental background to prove so. Hmm? These sirtuins modify the histones I was telling you before, but also are related with DNA damage. So this is a new, also a very active, um, um, how do you say, research area now relating to aging. I don't know many things about mitochondria, just the things I have to know being a teacher, but. Um, this I found very interesting because we, when we think about mitochondria and aging, we always think of uh, oxygen species which are toxic for the cell because they generate oxidation. But lately, it's been increasingly clear that mitochondrial DNA accumulates a lot of mutations and that these mutations are also involved in aging. I found this paper that might be interesting for you, in which they found how mitochondrial aging was accelerated by this antiretroviral therapy. But why? Just because it uh, favored the accumulation, you can see here, the ones treated with the antiretroviral. They had a significant higher number of mitochondrial mutations. So these cells have a mitochondrial dysfunction. If mitochondria does not work well, these cells have less energy and they do not function well, so it favors the dysfunction of the affected tissue. This um, uh, implication of mitochondrial DNA in aging is quite new and it's becoming more and more important because more and more works are being done. Nobody was looking at this and uh, 
it's being an, a new window of, uh, of, of uh, research that we are liking very much. I don't know if you know something about uh, reactive oxygen species, I, I'm sure you know, but uh, for me it was unexpected because recent reports are saying that maybe ROS were not so bad as we thought, and low levels of ROS might be even good uh, to boost in the cell a uh, stress response that would help this cell to cope with ROS and to even extend lifespan. This would be only true if rose accumulation would be not so, so big, just at the beginning of the mitochondrial dysfunction and at the beginning of the accumulation of rose. But I find this very, very uh, interesting because uh, now that we are more able in the lab to measure the quantity of oxygen species, it's when we are seeing that maybe they do not contribute so much to mitochondrial damage nor to mitochondrial dysfunction as we thought. We have to study them more, but maybe we should focus more on mitochondrial DNA alterations. In aging tissues, we always find senescent cells. Cellular senescence means a cell which has stopped dividing. It does not divide anymore. And it does not divide anymore because it carries a potentially oncogenic stress. To say so, it has a, carries a lot of DNA damage that cannot repair, or some oncogen is being activated. So the cell senses this potentially oncogenic stress and stops dividing. The cell is active, is metabolically active, but it does not divide anymore, so it does not spread this um, DNA damage to the progeny. Mm -hmm. Organismal um, aging, sometimes it's called cellular senescence, but it's, uh, for me it's not exactly the same because senescence is a cell phenotype. So what we see is that with age, the number of senescent cells in tissues doubles with respect to normal age. You have to we have to understand that this process is natural. Some cells, when they accumulate a lot of damage, they die, enter apoptosis and die. For example, leukocytes. But some other cell types, when they accumulate a lot of damage and they cannot repair, they enter senescence. For example, fibroblasts or epithelial cells. It depends on the cell type. So this is a normal mechanism to cope with DNA damage, but as we age, more and more senescent cells are found in, these t in, in tissues from old people. Mm -hmm. So these cells stop dividing, they change, they change shape, they get ugly, as we say in the lab. And uh, this is caused because of telomeric shortening, accumulation of DNA damage, activation of tumor suppressors, basically the same hallmarks of aging. Mm. Senescence is activated by the common pathway, or has a common pathway with the DDR, the DNA damage response, which is the P53 protein. When a cell enters senescence, depending on which of these factors generate senescence, is activated by P53 or by P16. So this is important. I tell you this only for one reason, is because maybe when we want to check if a tissue is old enough, we, wa we would like to see how many senescent cells are in there. And one way to look at it is to check for P16 or P53 levels by Western blood, for example. Another way to look for how many senescent cells do I have is to perform a test if these cells divide or do not divide anymore hmm? by checking KI 67 or doing the timid incorporation test. Also beta-gal, which you can see on the right, it's a very common um, a technique that we use to detect senescent cells. All, all the blue cells you can see are senescent. Senescent cells accumulate this um, foci of uh, heterochromatin. You can see here. And also, they accumulate a lot of uh, DNA repair proteins, 
and they accumulate all together in places where DNA repair cannot be performed. And these are called DNA scars, which are accumulation of a lot of DNA repair proteins. And these that we call foci, that can be seen in the microscope by immunofluorescence, all these foci can persist for days or months. And this is another characteristic of senescent cells, because they do not divide, they arrest because they, they cannot repair, but because they cannot divide, they don't um, uh, expand this damage. Mm -hmm. Finally, another characteristic of senescent cells is that they have a, a special secretory phenotype. They secrete a lot of cytokines, growth factors, and metalloproteases. So they generate inflammation and an immune response. What we think is that this is the strategy of the cell. When an organism is young and a cell gets damaged and this cell undergoes senescence, it's a way to call the immune system to get rid of this cell via this secretory phenotype. But what happens when the cell gets old, when the organism gets old? We find that we have an accumulation of senescent cells. What happens here? Do cells have more damage? Or maybe the immunological system cannot get rid of all the senescent cells because it does not function like before. Or maybe everything is happening together. Hmm? These are things that we still do not know. But we know is that in aging, there are more senescent cells. The secretory phenotype, then it's more relevant. So there's more um, pathologies associated with uh, this secretory and inflammatory phenotype. In the, places, in the tissues where there are a lot of senescent cells. For example, it has been just two weeks ago published that uh, these um, researchers have found um, uh, a new drug that is able to clear senescent cells from glial cells and so to prevent tau aggregation, which favors uh, um, Alzheimer, as you know. And the only thing that this uh, drug does is to get rid of senescent cells. So all this secretory phenotype is reduced and it alleviates these tau depositions. So there's a lot of uh, uh, research to do here. And these are many pathologies in which we find an increased frequency of senescent cells, which are a lot of them and all of them are aging uh, diseases. What we don't know, of course, these are hallmarks. We don't know if they are the cause or the consequence of aging. This is the big question here. So this has been a, a small overview about uh, aging and um, the hallmarks of aging. And now, if, if you allow me, I just want to explain a little bit more about DNA repair of a bit of what we do. We want to try to know if accumulation of DNA damage in cells, it's because simply we accumulate damage throughout our life, so when we are old we have more unrepaired DSBs in our cells, or because the, the DDR does not function so well. So we work with cells from the mammary gland of women below 27 or uh, older than 60 years old. We get these cells, we culture them in the lab, and we irradiate them, and we analyze how many breaks remain after irradiation. And this is a way to evaluate the efficiency of the repair. How do we do it? We count these which are marked by a phosphorylated high stone. This is a, an universal mark of breakage. When the DNA breaks, the H2 E stone gets phosphorylated. So if we detect this, it's a good surro surrogate of double stone breaks. Every foci means there it has been a break. So we can count. And this is what we do. We count on the microscope. It's a hard work, I can tell you. And um, what we found is that before irradiation, you can see that they are the number of breaks. All donors, they always have more breaks than young donors in their cells. And after irradiation, 
it's the same. It does not matter which time we evaluate, first hour, second hour, one day after irradiation, cells from all donors always have more breaks. Hmm? We have evaluated the speed of repair, and you can see that the speed is the same for all donors, which is the red line, compared to young donors. The problem is at the beginning. All donors seem to start to repair later, a little bit later, and these might favor the accumulation of some breaks that do not find a partner to repair. What we are just finishing now is we induce local damage so that we can differentiate this damage from the damage that was there before, because I've told you that all cells have more damage, so I want to be able to differentiate new damage from old damage. And we count how many repair proteins I can find in any break. We look for 53BP1 and BRCA1, which are it doesn't matter the name, but they are proteins from the homologous recombination or the non-homologous end joining pathway. We are now finishing to evaluate these, and we are just finishing, and we want to publish two papers about this. It's about to be done, but we found that 53BP1 recruitment is delayed in cells from all women. So it means there's a repair deficiency, at least in these cells, linked to age. This is what we think, no. our proposal. Another thing we do is analyze epigenetics, and what we, the epigenetic mark we analyze is H4K16 acetylation, which has been linked with 53B1 recruitment. And uh, this, is seti this uh, mark, this is the DNA, and uh, it's wrapped around the nu nucleosomes, and in here, the, the histone 4, I, so, woof, is acetylated by MOF, and in this, under these circumstances, it can recruit 53BP1. The Sear twins, which I told you before when I talked about epigenetics, are the ones in charge of eliminating these acetylation signals. The equilibrium between acetylations and the acetylations in the, in the genome are the responsible for maintaining the heterochromatin and eochromatin in the right proportions. So mm, DNA my, mm, then is properly relaxed or is more condensed, so it's more uh, accessible to DNA repair proteins or not. What we found in senescent cells, which are not aged cells, remember, now we know this, and also in cells that we've aged in vitro, so we've been accumulating passages in vitro, like 20, 25 passages, so trying to mimic organismal aging, which is not possible, but it's similar. These in vitro aged cells are not senescent. They divide, but they accumulate a lot of divisions. Both of them, they have low levels of H4K16, meaning this is altered with, age, with this kind of uh, aging processes, and this we've checked with many techniques. And you can see that at, here in this graph, what I show you is cells at different passages, five passages in culture, 10 passages in culture, 25, until 30 passages in culture. When cells are kept in culture, 53BP1 recruitment is, is and it does not function as well as in young cells. And this we can see here again. In old cells, you can see less 53BP1 than gamma H2IX. And in these cells, also you can see a reduction in H4K16 acetylation. So we think there's a, a relation between these two hallmarks, and what we think is that loss of, 53, of H4K16 acetylation limits recruitment of 53BP1. When we induce DNA damage, this phenotype is reverted because cell is stressed and the DDR is activated. Some acetylators are recruited, HK416 is recovered, and 53BP1 colocalization is also rescued. So, we are presenting this model in which we think HK416 acetylation must be kept under certain levels in order to ensure 
a correct DDR activation. If HK16 acetylation is lower, then the DDR does not function properly, or DNA repair proteins are not recruited fast enough to the, to the DSBS site. And just to end, I want to show you my group, because uh, in research, everything has to be done in a group, and nothing is possible alone. And uh, Lourdes and uh, Teresa, which are the two girls in the back, are the ones who have done most of the work, and I'm thankful for that. And uh, hope you've enjoyed it and learned something. I'm very thankful for being invited to be here. Thank you very much.